I'd like to welcome all of you. I'd like to welcome you to Bus Boys and Poets. Welcome to our tribe. This is a place where we say racial and cultural connections are consciously uplifted. A place to take a deliberate pause and feed your mind, body, and soul. A place where art, culture, and politics come together and intentionally collide. We believe by creating such a space, we can transform our neighborhoods, transform our city, and indeed transform the world. Thank you for being part of our tribe. Oh. I want to say a very special thank you, a heartfelt thank you to, a to IPS on his 50th anniversary. 50 years. 50 years of speaking truths to power, whether we're dealing with economic injustice, whether we're dealing with global warming, whether we're dealing with stopping the next war, we can count on IPS for thoughtful analysis that is grounded in intelligent humanism. This is what IPS is all about. I want to thank IPS for being the container for ideas that know no bounds, for thoughts that have absolutely no limits. Thank you, thank you IPS, for all that you've done for the past 50 years. Thank you IPS for inspiring us to do more than we ever thought we knew how. Thank you IPS for connecting us to so many heroes and super sheroes all of you among them here, thank you for making such long-lasting friendships. You have restored our faith in humanity, our faith in one another, and indeed you have redefined what it means to be an activist. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, IPS. I am, I am proud to be associated with this organization. I am proud to be a member of the board of IPS. I'd like to bring up to the stage the chairman of our board, Mr. Ethelbert Miller. Thank you, Andy. There was a time when IPS was located near DuPont Circle, and one could sit in the window of the building and look out at the world. The world can be a baffling place at times. It can be suffocating when one might simply want to breathe. Not far from IPS, people played chess in the Circle Park, contemplating their next moves. It was in the early 60s in the South Bronx that my cousin Robin and I became aware of think tanks. We placed Herman Kahn alongside Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle, the New York Yankees and the Rand Corporation, the Bronx Bombers, and a guy who was capable of thinking about the unthinkable. Little did my cousin and I know that on April 14th, 1961, two men in Washington attending a high-level State Department meeting filled with defense industry executives and generals would soon change the world. In her memoir, Border Crossings, Ann Barnett described how her husband, Dick Barnett, met Marcus Raskin. <laughs> For the last three days, we have been celebrating the anniversary of that meeting between these two beautiful dreamers, two men who left Camelot and became knights of their own making. Tonight, as I look around this room, let me make a bold statement. If this group here cannot bring about world peace, economic justice, racial equality, and build an environment of splendor, then I'm afraid no one can. My journey to IPS came during the days of Sue Goodwin and Mike Fortune and the Washington School. I came to IPS when there was a softball team. IPS played the Heritage Foundation. I came to IPS along and met people like Dan Moldea and Ariel Dorfman. 
like Dr. Rose, Billy Bathgate, it was juggling that got me here. It was a juggling of new ideas, of seeing the world from different perspectives, of encountering IPS fellows who are passionate about making this place a better place. I soon discovered that if one turned away from looking out that window on Q Street, one had to marvel at the intellectual lifting taking place at IPS. I recall the first harvest, the book edited by John Friedman with a preface by Gore Vidal, a book that pulled together the work of so many mindful minds associated with IPS between 1963 and 1983. In the very last paragraph of this book, Raskin writes, the outbreak of feeling transcends old conceptions of power. It is a new principle of action and understanding. The last three days we have been a witness to this outbreak of feeling, a feeling of love for what we do and what we believe in, a feeling of love for those who have departed, a feeling of love for those who had young hands reach out to transcend old conceptions of power. We gather this evening to break bread and reaffirm our community, to reaffirm those movements that embrace all that is yes in the world. We seek new principles of action and understanding. I speak this evening because the circle remains unbroken. In this room, one will find the leadership of IPS that has guided this organization for 50 years. I ask everyone who has ever been a member of the IPS board to now please stand. You represent, you represent the light and the wisdom. Your work has been deeply appreciated. And for the broad members who have left us, I close with the words of Bernice Reagan. You're not really going to leave me. It is your path I walk. It is your song I sing. It is your load I take on. It is your air I breathe is the record you set that makes me stand and go on. It is your strength that helps me stand. Thank you very much. John Cavana. Thank you, Ethelbert, and welcome to all of you. I know we have people upstairs, we have people in the main room, we have people in the back room. We welcome you all. It's so exciting that you're here. I, I first want to thank Ethelbert, who has brought creativity and exuberant energy into leading the IPS board. <laughs> Ethelbert. And many thanks to tonight's co-chairs for this event, Jody Evans, Andy Shalal, and Lisa Fuentes. And thanks to all the people in these three rooms of this restaurant. But to Andy, Lisa, Jody. With your support, IPS will stay strong for another 50 years. Now, one word, some of you are in this restaurant for the first time, so a word on Andy Shalal, our host tonight. For 15 years, IPS has worked with Andy to fight against unjust wars. And we have been proud and awed to watch Andy become a leader also of a company that is built to last, busboys and poets. And we celebrate tonight with some of our allies, we celebrate his advocacy. Andy has become the head of an alternative restaurant association that Restaurant Opportunity Centers United has created that is pushing to raise the tipped minimum wage, to, to get paid sick leave to push for immigrant rights. Let's hear it for Andy Shalal. This sounds like a man who should run a city. <laughs> so, now, a number of the people in this room, as you look around, lead the 50 core allied groups of IPS. Ijen, George, Sarita, May, Jody, Medea, Christy, Conrad. Many of you are here. We are nothing without you. And we thank you for joining us this weekend, tonight, and for the next 50 years. 
and I will admit to being a bit overwhelmed as I look around and I see these three rooms and I'm reminded of the amazing acts of different of you here that have made the world a better place. And I'm also aware that many of you know IPS quite well, but I'm excited to say that 50 to 70 of you are meeting IPS for the first time this weekend. And we welcome you into our community and I urge you to talk to any of, of the staff who are here. Now, Ethelbert saluted the board members, past and present. We have four former board chairs here. This is something he uniquely can appreciate as one of the great board chairs that I have ever seen. I want to say just a quick word about the people who've led this institution as directors. Seven people have directed IPS, starting with its co-founders, Mark and Dick, and then Diana DeVay, Richard Healy, Michael Schumann, but right after Mark and Dick, Bob Borisage guided IPS through some of our most <laughs> creative years before he became Jesse Jackson's issue director and then co-director of the Campaign for America's Future. And Bob is here tonight with his wife, Barbara Shaler, who served on our Latelier Moffat Committee for many years. And please join me in saluting Bob and, and Barbara. Uh, Now, we're going to toast two people tonight, but before we do that, I just want to say a word about the families who've served as the pillars of this institution. The two families, as Ethelbert mentioned, that threw caution to the wind and made a very big bet on IPS are, of course, the Raskins and the Barnetts. And Katrina Vanden Heuvel, in her beautiful tribute to IPS last week, described that fateful meeting between Mark and Dick that, that Ethelbert just described that led them to create IPS. I just want you, though, to imagine for a moment these two young men with families, including small children, many of whom are here today, dropping prestigious jobs, dropping everything to pursue a dream getting on a train every other week to go to New York to raise the funds, thinking big, being audacious, encouraging young people to break the law and avoid the draft, getting indicted, getting infiltrated and bugged, being at the top of Nixon's enemies list, setting up a transnational institute in Amsterdam, responding bravely to the assassinations of two colleagues on the streets of Washington, and that was just in the first 13 years. Imagine what those early years meant for the Barnett and, and Raskin families. These are families, I, I, I want us tonight to celebrate these families which built this institution and suffered when it suffered and celebrated when it won. Anne Barnett and the Barnett children have come into IPS a couple of times to share even going back to the meeting that was the formation of IPS. Anne has recorded some of these stories and we can share them with those of you who would like them. The Barnett family, I want to say, is the reason I came to IPS 30 years ago and convinced my extraordinary wife, Robin, to commute from Princeton and, and to come here too. Dick had written, as you know, the seminal work on multinationals and I wanted to come and write a sequel with him. And when I arrived, I was welcomed into this Barnett family that has embraced and nurtured IPS all these years. Now, Mark Raskin, I know you've, we've, we've applauded Mark all weekend, but he's the one who's been here from day one. I think no single individual has poured more of their heart and soul into this place than Mark. And it is our great joy today that he continues to come and work and share and mentor and build for the future. And his family, his family, you, you heard from Senator Jamie Raskin on Friday night, his family is also here tonight. And 
I, I just want to say one thing that to me is remarkable about these two families and the beginning of IPS, which is that even though IPS is now a totally different institution with totally different people, I am blown away by how much of what they and the founders put in place endures today. They prohibited IPS from taking government money. That is still in our bylaws and endures. They pioneered the idea of public scholars, individuals who linked research and education to social movements. That remains our model. They rooted us locally, nationally, and globally. Those remain our pillars. As impediments to progress, Dick Barnett pointed to the global corporation, Mark to the national security state. Both remain our movement's most prominent obstacles. Mark encouraged us to experiment with social inventions. We still do. This remains IPS's core. So I would like to ask the Barnett family and the Raskin family to rise, to stand, and accept our gratitude for 50 years of tender, loving care. <laughs> Okay, and there are, let me just say briefly, there are two other families here whose lives became intertwined with IPS in the 1970s, the Landaus and the Leteliers. And we're thrilled to have Christian Letelier and his wife and baby here. I'm just, um, imagine Isabel and Orlando's grandchild here tonight with the Barnett and the Raskin grandchildren. And on Saul Landau, most of you here tonight were at the celebration of Saul last night, so there's little more to add except that it gives us special pleasure to have so many of Saul's family here tonight. Yeah, deep, deep, deep thanks to you. Okay, now on to the two honorees and two toasts. We're, we're going to have two toasts now. And I'll just say there are many people here at every table who we could have honored tonight. And I just will note that at least three people here tonight, in addition to Mark, were in that original group. Tina Smith, Gar Alperovitz, and Arthur Waskow, and Norman Birnbaum was right behind. But there are three people who, to us, stood out for recognition because of the length and depth of their role with IPS, and because we couldn't imagine IPS being as strong as it is today without them. So first, to offer a toast to Harriet Barlow, I invite Chuck Collins and May Booby and Stuart Clark to come up to the microphone. Um, Chuck, I just want to say, he runs our Inequality and Common Good project. He's the person who led the fight against George Bush's attempt to kill the estate tax, and he won. And he sits on the board of the Blue Mountain Center where Harriet has been the director for three decades. Chuck Collin. Thank you, John. How about John Cavana, the man who weaves us together, the great weaver. I would like to offer a toast to Harriet Barlow in praise of a commoner. Harriet, wise, spirited, weaver, movement mensch and loyal friend, tough-minded strategist. Harriet believes the central purpose of progressive organizing is to weave together, braid together, the peace, justice, and environmental movements. Through her prodding, IPS has moved in that direction as central to our mission. Harriet and IPS share some things in common. We're committed internationalists. We believe in building institutions and maintaining them. Harriet co-created the Blue Mountain Center in the Adirondacks, 
Have any of you visited and tasted the water of the Blue Mountain Center? There, she's brought together some of our IPS staff, some of our allies, many others over the last 30 years to drink the water, talk late into the night, paddle canoes, and think big. In Mexico, a friend of mine who's an organizer said there are many kinds of power, but one of the most important kinds of power is the power to convene. Harriet at the Blue Mountain Center convenes activists around the dinner table. And later, she convenes us around the poker table. But when there's the rumbling of war, she convenes a whole circle of people to raise the resources and move the resources to build the organizations to fight the rumble toward war. Harriet is a storyteller. She has told stories of movement elders that have inspired me, Helen and Scott Nearing, Vincent and Rosemarie Harding, people she knew and whose story she brings into the present. Ask her to tell you her Julia Child story someday. Recently, I read a biography of Bob Swan, an activist in the 60s and 70s, and I got to the end and I read the acknowledgments the author put together, and she said, thank you, Harriet, for inspiring me and encouraging me to do this book. Harriet is everywhere. Her fingerprints are everywhere. Arlie and Adam Hochschild have a special message they want to send. These are people who helped found the Blue Mountain Center, uh, activists and writers from San Francisco who couldn't be here, but have loved and admired Harriet for 30 years. Here's what Adam and Arlie wrote. Edward Snowden is not finished with his revelations. One of the new ones is about to come out of the so National Security Agency that there is a whole division watching Harriet Barlow planning the demonstrations that caused such trouble for the World Trade Organization, Harriet was there. Bringing together leaders from different parts of the Occupy movement, she was there. Putting the idea of the commons into the national conversation, she was there. The list goes on. The array of work that Harriet does crosses boundaries and isn't limited to the usual categories. Most of us specialize in one thing or another. Harriet thinks big. Many of you have heard Harriet talk of doing the work. It's a wonderful idea. The idea that many of us do is not disconnected, but is part of something bigger. We at IPS celebrate the work of Harriet Barlow. In this sense, Harriet is like a one-woman institution providing a roof of care, support, and encouragement to the people working for social justice and a better world in a thousand different ways. In times when, they, when times have been dark, Harriet has held a protective hand around a flickering candle flame. So I hope you have a glass near you that you can raise. I ask you to join me in raising a glass to Harriet Barlow, to Harriet for her grace for her amazing skills in bringing people together, her enormous generosity, and savvy political awareness. To Harriet, for her positive perseverance, and of course, all the wonderful art and networking that's come out of the Blue Mountain Center, we toast a truly unique and caring individual. And I want you to repeat two words with me with this toast, in memory of David Hunter. Onward, commoner. Onward commoner. To Harriet. And I'd like to ask May Bouvet and Stuart Clark to come and present the ultimate weaver with a gift. Harriet, come on down. Thank you, Chuck. So Stuart and I are just going to say a, a few more words of thanks to Harriet. Um, my name is May Bouvet. I'm one of the co fa oh. <laughs> Um, I'm one of the co-founders of 350.org. We work on climate change. And um, 
It's such an honor to have a chance to celebrate Harriet and be amongst her fellow commoners. And in thinking about tonight, naturally I went to my inbox and I looked for the first email we had ever exchanged and it was almost exactly six years ago today. And it was, it was uh, much of it is still true, so I thought I would just read it briefly. The subject was, Bill McKibben's friend wants to meet you in San Francisco. <laughs> and I said, dear Harriet, I'm one of the Middlebury students working with Bill McKibben on our no carbon project. We can't wait to get started planning the big and small details to bring the idea to fruition and we owe so much to your generosity. And that's, other than not being a student anymore, that's all still true. And I think it's probably true for all of us here. We owe so much to Harriet's generosity of spirit. So I don't have a glass, but thank you. And Stuart. It's, it's really a, a great thrill and honor both to share a podium with May and with Chuck, and of course to be able to be a part of this, this wonderful celebration. Uh, my name is Stuart Clark and I work with the Town Creek Foundation. And I, I wanna say that a little earlier this evening, I learned that Alison Barlow, Harriet's daughter, was the millionth visitor at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. And as a result of that, she was awarded two tickets to every event taking place at the Barclays Center over the course of a year. And when I heard that, my first reaction, of course, was excitement for Allison. But, but I have to confess that my second reaction was to think, geez, how lucky can you be? This is Harriet's daughter. This is the person that hit the jackpot when she was born. This is the person that had the opportunity to grow up charged by the urgency of Harriet's vision, basking in the warmth of her generosity. How lucky can you be? And, and I'm not proud to say that that was my second reaction, but I am proud to say that it didn't take me but a few seconds to think about my own relationship with Harriet and to look around the room and to imagine what the relationship of many if not most of the people in this room with Harriet has probably been. And I thought, how lucky can we be? So I consider myself to be one of the luckiest people on the planet. And again, I don't have a glass either, but Harriet, thank you. So this is a, a very special gift that was created by the by people that the mothers of of, uh, the of the disappeared in Chile and was uh, taken around the United States by Isabel Letelier and it is IPS's gift to you. John says, if I have to say a word, I can say a word. And when a master of ceremonies says, if you have to say a word, you can say a word, you realize, especially if you have a chance to say a word later, you probably shouldn't. But I will say, the joy in this company is the joy of a lifetime of work together. And it is the greatest of honors to be with you it is beyond an honor. It is <clears throat> something um, unimagined that I would be on the same line of a program with Cora and Peter Weiss, who to me exemplify the dignity, grace, perseverance, and spirit of this movement. 
So I'm, I'm grateful, I'm touched, I'm moved, and I love the company. Thank you. So you want to give your pitch a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine. Okay, thank you so much. So tonight we have two honorees, and the second one is a couple. And for this toast, I ask Fiona Dove from the Transnational Institute and Christiane Letelier to come forward and join me at the podium. This is Fiona, and, and Christian is, is making his way. When you think of Cora Weiss, what do you think of? The Joe Moscow Club at the University of Wisconsin in the 1950s. The airlift that brought African students, including Barack Obama's father, to the United States with the help of Harry Belafonte, who is here tonight. Women Strike for Peace, the giant celebration of the end of the Vietnam War in Central Park, Hampshire College trustee, feminist, Riverside Church Disarmament Program, Hague Appeal for Peace, Samuel Rubin Foundation, peace educator, advocate for the United Nations. What about Peter Weiss? What do you think of when you hear those words? Helped break up the German conglomerates after World War II. Helped set up the American Committee on Africa, the Center for Constitutional Rights, the Lawyers Committee for Nuclear Policy, the International Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms, the successful 2006 drive to convince the International Court of Justice in The Hague to outlaw the use of nuclear weapons, the rehabilitation of the 1789 law, the Alien Tort Claims Act, to take on transnational corporations in U.S. courts. With all these accomplishments, why are we honoring them here tonight? Well, for those things, but also for something for us even more special, which is that in IPS's history, Cora and Peter nurtured one of our greatest successes, the creation of an international center of public scholarship in Amsterdam, the Transnational Institute, which recognized that many of our biggest challenges are global and which created a space for activists and researchers to forge new international experiments. Beyond that, and you will hear this in IPS speak, Peter placed the covenant, the UN covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights at the center of IPS work, and Cora placed the word peace, not just foreign policy or anti-militarism, but peace at the center of our conversation. Michael Clare, a prominent former IPS and TNI fellow, and now the five college professor of peace and world securities, put it this way. When we think of the great movers and shakers of IPS, it is impossible to overstate the vital contribution of Peter and Cora. Cora, by channeling the values and philanthropic integrity of her visionary father, Sam Rubin, helped IPS get off the ground in 1963, when few other donors were inclined to support such a radical and unprecedented experiment. And Peter, the other half of this remarkable partnership, served as the Institute's first board chair and helped steer IPS through its first tumultuous years. And I, just one more thing from Michael Clare. I wanna honor Cora and Peter's moral leadership and all their years of activism and organizational leadership, they've never lost sight of the fundamental commitment to human values. They've never failed to remind the rest of us of our obligation to promote peace and justice in every possible way. Fiona Dove, the director of the Transnational Institute, is now going to give the toast to Peter and Cora. Fiona Dove. Thank you, John. I'm so proud to be here to help celebrate IPS's golden jubilee. I'm especially proud to be here as the embodiment of what John referred to as IPS's most successful 
project its greatest achievement, the Transnational Institute coordinated from Amsterdam. TNI began as the international project of IPS 40 years ago. As IPS serves the movements of the United States of America, so TNI serves the global movement. TNI may be the greatest achievement of IPS, but I would say it's also the greatest achievement of the Wise family. They have been our most loyal supporters for 40 years. Peter served as a TNI fellow for many years and has continued to be one of our most valued advisors till today. He's considered one of the most innovative international human rights lawyers in the world. An entire global movement currently working to make transnational corporations legally accountable for harms caused look to Peter as a pioneer in this field. Cora is a queen of the peace movement internationally as anyone who saw her <laughs> pull off the biggest peace conference in history in The Hague in 1999. 10,000 people came to Holland under the leadership of Cora. Cora and Peter are true internationalists. This remarkable couple have contributed so much, so consistently, with such integrity for so many decades to the cause of a more just and peaceful world. They have earned their place in our hearts, in our histories, and our everlasting respect and gratitude. May they serve as an inspiration for many generations to come. Cora and Peter, chapeau. So as Cora and Peter come forward, Christiane Atelier is going to present them with another of the arpieras which Isabel Atelier brought to the US with the women, the mothers, the daughters, the sisters of the disappeared in Chile and toured through the United States in a giant education tour pushing for justice in Chile. I want to say Isabel, Christiane's mother, wished she could be here tonight. She recently injured an eye and joined a large group of us who only see out of one eye. But she was really thrilled to have Christiane and his wife, Kristen, and, and, their, and their daughter here today. So, Christiane. Thank you so much, Cora and Peter, on behalf of my family. You've taken our family under your wing. You are very special. This is an honorary only because what can honestly match the contributions that you two have made? Thank you so much. On behalf of my family, we love you, we respect you, we honor you. Thank you for everything. I guess this is for longevity. <laughs> so I just wanted to say, if I know you, I love you, and if I haven't met you yet, I love you too. I had a peek at the future, and I was at the centennial of IPS. And I saw all of you being honored there. Because by then, you will have eradicated poverty. You will have abolished war. You will have prohibited human rights abuses. You will have denied corporations the role of citizen. And you will have transferred 
the military budget to human security. You brought 99% to the table, and you invited the 1% to join you as long as it was a level playing field. You capped carbon emissions, and there's a solar panel on every roof. That's the challenge for IPS for the next 50 years, and that's what everyone here must endow. Thank you for this. John and Sarah, where's Sarah? Christian and Fiona, you're not what's wrong with the world. Peter Weiss is going to add a word here to what Cora has said. Peter. Okay. You want to hold it? Um. If I were not uh, such a humble person to begin with, I would really fully enjoy this wonderful award. Uh, as, as it is, I accept it with immense gratitude for, you know, my eyes are not that good at my age, so. As it is, I, I accept it with immense gratitude for what could be better than being recognized by an institution which has learned so much from me. <laughs> About 49 years ago, Mark and Dick came to see me at my office, and they said they had sort of dithered for the first year of IPS looking for the vision which they couldn't find. And they asked me to help them find the vision, and I humbly agreed. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh at this. <laughs> so, in, in what could have been Bertolt Brecht's immortal world, an award from IPS is worth more than the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and so I say, onward, there is work to be done. Thank you, Cora and Peter. Now, we're, we're Harriet Barlow has asked to say one more word, so I'm going to pull Harriet Barlow up here, and while she's coming, I also just want to say the final person after Harriet will be Jody Evans. And I, let me just say a word about Jody while, as Harriet comes up. This is the woman who was the heart and soul of this dinner and the gala which follows it. I don't know if you're all aware, but at 7.45 to 8, there are buses out here that will bring you to Union Station where we will continue the party. 
and Harry Belafonte will say a few words, and Amy Goodman, and Ijen and Sarita will give a toast. So you're all invited. But Jody Evans is our board member. Jody and Medea, and many of you here at Code Pink, have helped turn up Washington upside down. You did it in the build-up to the Iraq War. You do it now. Jody has been a spark for so many of us, for IPS, for the Rainforest Action Network, the Women's Media Center, Threshold, all with a selfless, brilliant energy that moves us all. And she and Ijen Poo and Sarita Gupta have added to the noble goals of peace, justice, and the environment that our movements embrace the simple, old-fashioned notion of love. So Jody will follow Harriet. Harriet Barlow, though, come back up to the stage. I told you so. So when John uh, called to say that the board um, had done this amazing thing to, to put my name with Cora and Peters, I said, oh, well, of course, the credit should go to the HKH Foundation, two of whose trustees are here tonight, Herman Hotzfeld and Bob Worth. And he, he said, of course, because HKA be HKH believed in this organization for decades, but he wanted to do it his way. And I said, well, I'll let you do it your way if I can do something my way. And my way is to say, you can't bring people together who have the opportunity to hear from people like Cora and Peter and Jody and all of those you've heard from this weekend and to have had the opportunity to reflect upon this amazing history. I really hope that the shower of words that have flowed down upon IPS this weekend will refresh them from the work they had to do to put it together. But you, like me, have heard these words, brilliant, visionary, committed, dedicated, always working in solidarity, always working from strategy, always working from analysis, always attending to history, always bringing every generation together, things that are not replicated widely enough in our movement. And I, as a person who has depended upon this institution, want to say, if you would listen for one minute, that there's one thing we have to do, every one of us, because we are the people who know that the elixir that is added to all those qualities, the elixir of sweetness, and it is not a word one can apply to institutions very often. But if anyone has known and thought about Dick and Mark, our wonderful John Cavana, our wonderful Jody, our wonderful staff, our wonderful board chair, our wonderful donors, you will know that without sweetness, which is a dedication to attention, which is the primary quality that allows us to work beyond racism and beyond classism, attention, you will understand that we, you and I, you and I, have to do what foundations will not do. We have to commit ourselves to funding the sweet elixir and all those other great qualities. So I'm, I insisted on standing up here to ask you to do something. I'm asking you to make an internal commitment to become annual donors, annual, it's a key word, annual donors, each and every one of us, to this institution. And although we all hate to... We all uh, Americans hate to think about the inevitable, but I, I also want to say, and to put IPS in our wills, those of us who are 
40 or 50 or 60 or 70. Because if we are lucky and the future is fortunate, this institution will be here, as many have said, 50 years from now. But it depends on us, all of us. So please make that internal commitment and act it out year by year. And I thank you for letting me do the inevitable. Make the pitch. Thank you very much. So I just want to say thank you. Because Code Pink loves IPS, and we couldn't resist a banner hang. <laughs> Thanks, Tig. <laughs> so thank you for the enormous generosity. Thank you for helping me prove that IPS could finally have a fundraiser, and that we could celebrate all the amazing activists that helped take the ideas into action. But I was introduced to IPS by my husband, Max Kalevsky, in the 70s. And I was introduced to the IPS because Max loved Dick and Mark. He loved them. And he brought them into our home and held them. So what I know about IPS is that IPS is love. Because IPS took in Code Pink the day we started and created home for us and nurtured us and created space and I have seen love happen this weekend. And so for me, what IPS is the space of holding, the space where we get to be all that we are, the place where we get to celebrate what we are, the place that we get to mirror each other and hold each other and be. And so I have enormous gratitude to be part of this family. And I want to say you and the person next to you and the person you're going to be with over at Union Station we are those that are bending history. So take tonight to celebrate, to love, to nurture, because we need all the juice for what's ahead. And thank you so much for joining with us tonight. OK, enjoy your dinners. See old friends. I'll announce at 7.45 when these buses are ready to go, and, and one series of them will go to Union Station, and if you want to stick around a little longer, they'll be back in about 20 minutes. Thank you deeply to the staff of IPS, from Joy Zaremka, to the development staff, to the communications team, to every single IPSer who worked so hard, worked so hard, and put together so much of this. It's a privilege for me to work with them, and we all owe them a debt of gratitude as well. So enjoy. Yeah. Right, Jamie Raskin, one thing. Jamie Raskin has, has a small thing to present to IPS, state senator from Maryland. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, m most of the legislation I work on does not pass unanimously, like uh, the abolition of the death penalty, which we did last year, and uh, <laughs> marriage equality and the national popular vote. But uh, I, I, got some th I got a proclamation through the Maryland General Assembly unanimously, and it says, be it hereby known to all that sincerest congratulations are offered to the Institute for Policy Studies in recognition of 50 years of creative and indispensable thought for the progress of American democracy presented on this 11th day of October on behalf of the Maryland General Assembly by Senator Jamie Raskin. So, uh, And 
And I'm also told that we have failed to mention the great late Ekbal Ahmed, who we need to mention tonight. So. Now, I'll just say as Jamie's going, IPS lost two board members this year, Saul Landau, Elsbeth Bothy. We also just lost one of our great allies who was 100 years old, Peggy Spinell. So it's been a difficult year in, in that respect, and we, we are honored to have some of Elsbeth's friends here, to have so Saul's family here, to have one of Peggy's dearest friends. And they helped us plan this celebration, Elsbeth on the board, Saul on the board, and Peggy, and we remember them tonight, and we thank them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's yours. <laughs> yeah. Did you want the picture of me presenting to you? I just wanted to. I just wanted to add <coughs> a few words <coughs> before we go. <coughs> Earlier, we talked about <coughs> how families struggled. And that was true also for your family, for John Cabana, who put all of this together, all of it. And, yeah, oh, good, thank you. And Jesse, who p is not here. Oh, good, all right. Let's hear it for Jesse, the son. And where's your wife? All right, and Robin is here, and let's hear it for Robin, and thank them, uh, and th Thank all of you for coming. Thank you all.